the opening ceremony for African Ancestry Month. Before we begin, I would like to ask Mr. Bryan to step up and read the proclamation. All right, National African Ancestry Month at Passaic County Community College. Whereas February 1st through February 28th is designated as National African Ancestry Month in the United States of America. Whereas Passaic County Community College is committed to hosting activities, highlighting the history and culture of people of African descent. Whereas the many African American people that have made their home in Passaic County throughout New Jersey and the United States have been helpful in molding social, cultural, and economic life. Whereas the theme for this month is a century of black life, history, and culture. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Stephen Rose, president of Passaic County Community College, hereby proclaim February 1st to February 28th, 2015, National African Ancestry Month at Passaic County Community College. Uh, signed, Dr. Stephen M. Rose, February 1st, 2015, 25, uh, president of Passaic County Community College. Thank you for reading our proclamation. As I forgot, as I neglected to say earlier, my name is Pia. I am one of the student activities assistant as well as the advisor for SPC, which is our student programming committee. And for this month's opening, we are having a speaker, Enrique Nogueira, and he's going to be talking about the lessons from the libraries of Timbuktu, which pinpoints how culture have changed throughout the decades, as well as his own experience here in the United States. So with that being said, our student ambassador, Sahani, will be introducing our speaker. Good afternoon. For those of you who may not know, our speaker, Enrique Noguera, is the EOF administrator for the Educational Opportunity Fund at the State County Community College. Mr. Noguera's research focuses on non-traditional youth engagement and social emotional safety in urban schools. Mr. Noguera is the advisor of PCCC's Gamma Upsilon Chapter of Chi Alpha Epsilon National Honor Society and an active supporter of BMLI, the Black Male Leadership, excuse me, Leadership Initiate. <clears throat> Outside of PCC, Mr. Noguera directs scholars organizing culturally innovative opportunities, a Saturday civic engagement and college preparatory program that trains Franklin <clears throat> Franklin High School students in Somerset, New Jersey, to use geographic information systems, technology to build maps that are used to improve their community and beyond. Enrique Noguera received his bachelor's degree in urban planning and Africana studies from Rutgers University, and his master's in social and philosophical foundation of education from Rutgers. Previously, he has occupied positions with AmeriCorps and Rutgers University. Prior to arriving at PCCC in July 2014, he was a school climate and culture specialist at Red Bank Middle School in Red Bank, New Jersey. Can we all give a warm welcome to our speaker, Mr. Enrique Noguera. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful. Um, Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I am going to begin by just reading this piece that I put together um, while I was in college at Rutgers. And I'd actually like to rename my talk officially, uh, What Lies Beneath. It's actually more fitting given the content of what we're gonna talk about today. What Lies Beneath, a tightly woven tapestry of time all threads are integral in my design. The grand seamstress sews to the pulse of the doom doom. It's the West African girl. Blended to the melodies of Bugsy Sharp and his steel pan. Tick, 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 boom. A carnival of collected cultures are crocheted onto the quilt. Bass clefts bounce with the vibrations as they strum the treble strings to the beat. On the other side, Europe is glued on, not stitched. It robbed and raped my Africa when already it was rich. A Spanish conquistador is drawn in pencil holding a firearm to a great grandmother's breast, forcing the fornication of colonization and culture. Each pelvic pump 
bleached black silk and Revlon each strand of my cosmic connection. My complexion is a daily reminder of its deception. Hello everyone. Again, my name is Enrique Noguera and I'm an EOF administrator here at Passaic County Community College. It is a privilege to stand before you today to kickstart Black History Month here at the college, its opening ceremony. I began with What Lies Beneath, a poem I wrote while I was an undergrad at Rutgers because it's a snapshot of who I am, of my heritage and where I come from. On the surface, it explains my physical appearance, why I look the way I do. But on a deeper level, it's a major factor for why I agreed to stand here before you today. Before I begin my talk, I must say that the black experience in America has been poked and prodded and molded and truncated and watered down and molded so much that for fear of perpetuating a cycle of miseducation and misrepresentation, I would not dare present my rendition of a century of black life and culture here before you today. I wouldn't be qualified to do that. Even if I was a historian or received my doctorate in Africana studies, it's impossible to accurately capture the experience or impact made by any group of people in its entirety from one voice in one 30-minute presentation. In other words, the story needs to be shared by many voices in classrooms, in homes, public fora, all around the world, and it needs to be informed by scholarly, peer-reviewed works in the form of books, articles, and lived experiences. So I decided to use my black experience in Trinidad and in the United States as a roadmap to guide, to guide my presentation. This means that I will jump. I'm going to jump from continent to continent. I'm going to jump from era to era for the sake of time. And this will all happen as I weave my own life's experiences through the narrative. I hope I can answer all your questions at the end of the talk, but it is my mission as today's presenter and as an educator to whet your intellectual appetites so that you leave here wanting more and asking questions about who you are and where you come from. Now, let's begin a more thorough introduction. My name is Enrique Omar Mandela Noguera. Aside from the blood flowing through my veins, my earliest connection to the continent is my middle name, Mandela continent of Africa, that is. In 1994, Nelson Mandela became the first president of a free black South Africa, or free South Africa period, after spending 27 years in prison resisting apartheid, a race-based system of oppression similar but worse than Jim Crow here in the United States, where black people were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Upon assuming role as president, the mastermind that was Mandela was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, and Satyagraha. He adopted peace and reconciliation instead of responding to violence with violence. Now, a question for the audience. Name a popular African American figure who was also inspired by Gandhi and Satyagraha. Let me see some hands. I'll give you a, a, a hint. There's a gigantic statue of him in the hallway. <laughs> Yes, Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All right, so now as I said, I was named after Mandela, but I was not born in 1994, after he assumed presidency in, in South Africa. I was born in 1986, when he was still in prison. Back then, there was a global movement which was pivotal in bringing down apartheid called divestment. So divestment, so the opposite of investment, right? Investing, putting time into something, putting money into something. Divestment was about pulling resources out. The divestment campaign, after being realized in federal legislation enacted in 1986 by the United States, is credited by some as pressuring, pressuring the South African government to embark on negotiations, ultimately leading, 
to the dismantlement of apartheid system before because of the fact that it pressured corporations and major institutions, many universities, to stop operating and investing money in the South African economy during the time of apartheid. All right, so it, it forced these organizations, it pushed these organizations to stop putting money into the economy. This campaign was broadly backed by a diverse array of activists, including scholars and universities, university students around the world. While my father was at Harvard, he was quite active in the campaign. On my birthday in Port of Spain, Trinidad, he was involved in a major demonstration, boycotting a game, a match, a cricket match between Trinidad and South Africa, that after having left to greet me for the first time at the hospital when I was born, the peaceful demonstration erupted into violence as the police attacked all the demonstrators. So it's no surprise that he felt compelled to name me after Mandela. It is not just the divestment and the anti-apartheid demonstrations that ended apartheid, though. But it, if not for the 55,000 Cuban volunteers under the leadership of Fidel Castro at the Battle of Quito Cuayavale in Angola, the region would not have taken many would have taken many more years to to topple. I'll just pull up a map here so we can. When I'm referring to these countries, it's important to just be able to see where they are. All right, just so you can see. Right, Angola right there above Namibia. All right, Castro was instrumental in that. All right, so I'm gonna jump back for a second. So I spent the first nine years of my life living in Diggle Martin and Mileval, Trinidad. Some of my fondest memories took place in my father's study. It was a small room that could only be accessed through a winding staircase. Its walls featured artifacts of revolution and posters of freedom fighters and knowledge brokers from around the world, including Nelson Mandela, Steve Biko, including Marcus Garvey of Jamaica, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara of Cuba, Stokely Carmichael, A.K. Kwame Ture of Trinidad, Ivan Van Sertema of Guyana, Malcolm X, Huey P. Newton of the United States, and an image of an unnamed Moor from Morocco. On Sundays, right, Morocco is the northwest, okay, the northwest region of Africa there. On Sundays, even though we were raised Muslim and regularly attended the mosque, my father would lead us to the study and read to us from the Quran from the Bible, from the Bhagavad Gita, so that we could celebrate the uni universality of God. Toward the end of the session, he would always tell us stories about the men on the wall. Today, I'm most familiar with Mandela's story. But at the time, I remember being most fascinated by the image of the Moor because, like me and Brother Malcolm, he was Muslim. I'll pull up a picture of the Moors so you guys can see what the Moor look like. Moors. The Spanish occupation by the Moors began in 711 AD when an African army under the leadership of Tariq ibn Said crossed the Strait of Gibraltar from northern Africa and invaded the Iberian Peninsula, Andalus. All right, so just to refer back to the map for a second, that's like right here. Morocco, the Moors crossed. Right? And this is where they set up camp, right? In Spain, right? Spain and what is modern day Spain and Portugal. All right. The Moors who ruled Spain for 800 years introduced new scientific te techniques to Europe, such as the astrolabe, a device for measuring the position of stars and planets, scientific progress in astronomy, in chemistry, in physics, mathematics, geometry. Philosophy flourished in Moorish Spain. At its height, Cordoba, the heart of the Moorish territory in Spain, was the most modern city in all of Europe. The streets were well paved and raised sidewalks were there for pedestrians. During the night, 10 miles of streets were well illuminated by lamps. This was hundreds of years before there was paved, a one paved street in Paris or a street lamp in London. Education was universal in Moorish Spain, available to all, while in 
Christian Europe, 99% of the population were illiterate. Even kings could neither read nor write. At that time, Europe had only two universities. The Moors had 17. In the 10th and 11th centuries, public libraries in Europe were non-existent. While Moorish Spain could boast of more than 70, of which one in Cordoba housed 600,000 manuscripts. Over 4,000 Arabic words and Arabic-derived phrases have been absorbed into the Spanish language. The Moors introduced paper to Europe and Arabic numerals, which replaced the clumsy Roman system. The, Moorish, the Moors introduced many new crops, including oranges, lemons, peaches, etc. Right? Many of which remain Spain's main products today. The Moorish rulers lived in palaces, while the monarchs of Germany, France, and England lived in big barns. The barns had no windows, no chimneys. There was only one hole in the roof for, for an exit to allow smoke to exit. It was through Africa that new knowledge of China, India, and Arabia reached Europe. The Moors brought the compass to China, from China into Europe. The Moors ruled the Iberian Peninsula, comprised of modern-day Spain and Portugal, as I said, until 1492, with the fall of Granada. Spanish refer to this period of time as la reconquista, which is the reconquest. In short, the Moors made tremendous contributions to the world that are still present today. That's right. You may know something about Egyptians, about ancient Egypt, but now you know a little bit something about the Moors, if you didn't already. The message is plain and simple. Black people, descendants of Africans, our history is bright and beautiful, and it begins well before slavery in the Americas. All right, back to my story. On July 27th, 1990, there was an attempted coup d'etat where a fundamentalist Islamic group known as the Muslimin attempted to overthrow the Trinidadian government and take political control of my country. This marked an important turning point in my life, not only because we stopped attending the mosque, but shortly after this event, my parents' marriage ended. They got divorced. And my brother, sister, and I left the country with my mother to permanently live in the United States. My mother graduated from Rutgers University with a bachelor's in psychology, but after moving to Trinidad and spending 11 years as a housewife, she returned to the United States as a single mother with three children to feed. We spent the first six months of our experience in the U.S. living with my uncle in Chesapeake, Virginia. My mother worked 50 hours a week packing refrigerators and cashiering at a local 7-Eleven while my siblings and I experienced the smack in your face reality of being racially classified as other. It's part of the challenge. Uh, I quickly realized one of the challenges of being culturally racially mixed people and, and living in the United States. Even though my mother is primarily black and Cherokee, and my, mother and my father's parents were born in the Caribbean with ancestors from Venezuela, Spain, and the western coast of Africa, who were brought to the Americas through the Middle Passage like many other ancestors. Most people felt uncomfortable around me and my siblings because they couldn't place us in any single racial or ethnic box. So they just made assumptions about who we were. In Chesapeake, I was just other, because I sounded like I was Jamaican and I looked like Puerto Rican. Um, but by the time my mother moved to Orange, New Jersey, and my Trinidadian accent began to fade, I immediately became labeled as Latino, or Spanish. My brother became Indian because of the three of us, he has the darkest skin, and he has long, black, straight hair. My sister, would be classified as looking Latina because of the fact that she looks like a mix of the two of us. And she, you know, either that or she could be classified as being light skinned black, you know, because of her light skin. That's a challenge. However, very few people in those early years would ever believe that I'm of African descent. And still today, 
many people don't believe. Um, as if I feel some kind of invisible brown bag test. And when they saw my siblings and I together, it was very difficult for them to believe that we came from the same two parents. I remember many occurrences, many times in the barber shop, in the supermarket, where people would look, at, look and ask like how we were related, how we knew each other. And they'd say, somebody done lied to you if you think y'all came from the same family. <laughs> it's terrible. As you can probably imagine, those early years were uncomfortable at times, but the observations that stuck with me regarding my early black experience in American schools was that even though I took American history probably about 10 times between like third grade and 10th grade, whether it was my, my public elementary school in Chesapeake, Virginia, or Orange, New Jersey, or my private Blue Ribbon High School in Montclair, New Jersey, very little black history was featured in my American history class. They always featured lessons about Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., maybe Malcolm X, and they taught us that the black experience in America began with slavery. After living in Trinidad and losing my accent, I found myself assimilating into this urban American culture. As I assumed a new lifestyle, I began letting go of my Trini multicultural heritage. As many of my father's stories drifted from my memory, aside from brief conversations about disbelieving peers with disbelieving peers about people like Ivan Van Sertema, who, spent, who did extensive research demonstrating that Africans came to the Americas before Columbus. I really didn't, you know, I didn't really know, I didn't do much about the truncation of black history in school until I was a senior at my Blue Ribbon Private High School in Montclair when my US history teacher made the very great mistake of comparing the Black Panthers and saying that they were the black version of the Ku Klux Klan. He had an image, apparently hadn't done much research, but he just had an image of Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, right, and they're holding guns. They got their, their black leather on, their black berets, and then next to it he had a, a member of the Klan. At that moment, something inside me stirred, and I imagined the poster of Huey P. Newton on my father's, in, on the wall of my father's study. Almost as if my spirit was attempting to jump out of my body, I jolted to my feet with my curly afro in full effect, and from the back of my history class, I respectfully challenged my professor. Challenged his false claim. Cobwebs brought on by self-inflicted suppression of my people's history in an attempt to fit into a society that celebrated lies passed on as truth by colonizers in the form of American history. At that moment, I woke up. And until the end of the period, I began to rattle off who the Black Panthers really were. While the KKK indiscriminately discriminated against black, some white, every shade between, and were responsible for racially charged lynchings of countless black people in the name of white power, or white pride. The Black Panthers were a social service organization that practiced armed self-defense. Formed in 1966 in Oakland, California, while they policed the police in a time, yeah, they policed the police in a time when there was overt harassment of black people in the street. They knew their rights. They ran free breakfast programs and rent for children and community health clinics. How could you make the comparison? I ended my sermon by informing my peers and teacher that I refused to be miseducated. And whether appropriate or not, I took a page out of Gil Scott Heron's book and took them and I told them that the revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. There will be no rerun, and the revolution will be live. And I walked out of class. <laughs> With that, I marched out of class, leaving my dumbfounded audience mentally masticating on Heron's electric piece and probably thinking about, just thinking now I was going to start some kind of uprising in the school. Fortunately, this was after or before Columbine. Charged and changed forever by my outburst, I knew that I had something. I had to do something about this miseducation immediately. 
The kids going to this school where their fathers were doctors and lawyers and politicians. And as we needed to know, the students, the few students of color in the school is also very important for them to know black history, accurate accounts of black history. I gathered my friends, and after a few after-school meetings, we decided to form a committee called the African American Studies Committee, with the mission of starting an African American Studies class. And until we got our class, our primary function was to educate the school community about black history, even if that meant force-feeding the people information. We were not playing. <laughs> Within a week, we drafted a petition for the class and got it signed by 95% of the student body. We printed a newsletter called The Movement that featured the black power fist as its emblem. The movement served as our major means of educating the students. In accordance with our mission, we featured bios of influential African Americans that we didn't learn about in school, like Kwame Ture, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Ella Baker, Angela Davis, Marcus Garvey. We also featured opinion pieces about the state of black people in America at that time. Our final attempt at providing the people with information came at the end of the week. I signed up to read Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream in front of the whole school during this morning meeting. But since I felt bad about only offering my history class an element of Gil Scott Heron's piece, I instead decided to perform The Revolution Will Not Be Televised with full force in front of the entire student body. At the end of the assembly, silence ensued, and everyone in the audience looked shocked, right? As if, um, except my colleagues in the balcony who had been working with me the whole time. They knew what the plan was, right? They smiled and saluted me with fists raised. Moments after walking off the stage, the dean ushered me to the principal's office to explain my actions. <laughs> Now, knowing that I was one of the few students of color at that school and that I was there on scholarship, I was very conscious of my tone as I explained that I just wanted to expose my peers to the wealth of knowledge and tremendous global contributions made by Africans and black people. I explained everything that my friends and I accomplished in a matter of like a week and the great amount of work that still needed to be done trying to appeal to the brilliant educator that existed beneath her rough principal exterior. I continued on with her, but she interrupted my explanation by saying that she was proud of what we were doing. And in this case, I would not face any consequences, so I was kind of relieved about that. <laughs> as long as I followed the appropriate channels for starting the class. I felt relieved by the outcome, but I knew with only a few weeks before graduation, I would have to kind of lay low, work with the administration. My colleagues and I received scholarships upon graduation for our activism, but guess what? We never got our class. At Rutgers, I made it a point to minor in Africana Studies so that I could deepen my very bare bones understanding of the tremendous impact made by black people around the world. Africana complemented my urban planning major because I studied power levers, anchor institutions in a given city, right, in the form of schools, places of worship, that influence how people think and what they do, right, and what we do in the grand scheme of things, in the workings of the world. Eventually, I received a master's in education because I realized that it's dangerous when teachers miseducate students about their history, and when textbook publishers mask events like Columbus's genocide, the mass killing that began in 1492 as the arrival of civilization, and the discovery of the new world when it was already inhabited by the Caribs and Arawaks and other native groups, or when proven facts are intentionally omitted from high school textbooks like Africans visiting the Americas before they were brought over as slaves. Or the Moors who ruled Spain for 800 years. Or when John Edgar Hoover's COINTELPRO and its military dis dismantlement of the Black Panther Party and the whole Black Liberation Movement. These are absent from the textbooks. 
So what does this mean for all of us today? What is our response to the mass incarceration of black people in the US? According to the NAACP, the US is 5% of the world's population and makes up 25% of the world's prisoners. African Americans now constitute nearly 1 million of the total 2.3 million incarcerated population. What is our response to the NAACP's legal defense fund that highlighted more than 75 men, women, and children of color who have been gunned down by police since Amadou Diallo's death in 1999? Unarmed people. While you think about those questions, remember that we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors from all over the world who fought, bled, and died for us to be afforded the right to vote and the opportunity to attend and pay for college, this opportunity. And that we have a responsibility to secure these opportunities for ourselves, our families, our communities, and for those who are unborn, those to come. In addition, do not accept the second class stamp of Negro or the other N-word. Do not sit and soak in ignorance. Don't just take my word for it. Read about your history. Okay? If you need suggestions for books, talk to me. I have lists. All right? Pay attention to current events in Patterson, in New Jersey, in the US, and throughout the world. Whether you are black, white, or brown, we are all connected. In celebration of our common humanity, let's treat each other with love and with respect. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Noguero for enlightening us about the African culture. To show our gratitude, we would like to present you with this certificate of appreciation. Oh, thank you. As for the audience, we hope that you all were able to learn something from this presentation. So this will conclude our opening ceremony for African Ancestry Month. We do hope that it was enlightening, it sure was for me. I was able to learn a whole lot from this and hopefully you guys are able to see a different side to what we thought was African culture here in America.